Good evening. I have some news that will delight you. Murder is not dead. I do not refer to the ones splashed all over the front pages. Those are in such bad taste. I refer to those exquisite murders that have a touch of the bizarre and which take fiendish ingenuity to solve. Those are alive and well. One will be presented for your shivering delight immediately. Is anything wrong? Am I acting as if there's something wrong? Hey! Your girlfriend stole $40,000. Where are you going? I'm looking for a private island. You mean an institution? A madhouse? There are plenty of motels in this area. She spent last Saturday night at the Bates Motel. We just keep on lighting the lights and following the formalities. This is the first place it looks like it's hiding from the world. I'm sure there's something wrong out there, and I have to know what. My mother, uh, she isn't qu quite herself today. Norman Bates' mother has been dead and buried in Green Lawn Cemetery for the past ten years. I declare. Don't you touch me. Don't put me down. I don't like you going to that house alone. I can handle a sick old woman. <gasps> it's not as if she were a maniac. She just goes a little mad sometimes. <laughs> we all go a little mad sometimes. We were on north by northwest and we weren't looking for the next one particularly. And it wasn't until we finished shooting and we were preparing for post-production and Hitcher would read the New York Times book section. on my, He'd read it over the weekend or bring it into the office on Monday. And we saw this um, very good review by Boucher on, a, on this book cycle. So Hitch said, call Paramount and get coverage on it. Well, Paramount hadn't covered it. And Hitch went over to England, and as he was at the airport, he saw the shelves of this book, Psycho. So he called me and said, haven't you got coverage from Paramount yet? And I said, no, Paramount didn't cover it. So he said, all right, he got the book, and he read it going over, and he called back from London to say, I got our next subject, Psycho. It's a much more violent book than it is a movie. You know, the girl gets beheaded in the showers as, as opposed to simply stabbed to death. But the book is mild by comparison with the facts of Ed Gein. This is one of those series of murders that so shocked the nation that it became part of American mythology. And, you know, we weren't around in 1960, so it's hard to know how the, the facts impacted the fiction. Um, but one's got to assume that one of the reasons why both the book and the movie are so successful is because people knew that, albeit remotely, they were based on truth. The contemporary accounts speak of the police, who I think were a tough bunch of people, still being totally appalled at what they found inside. Here's a guy out in Wisconsin, the wilds of Wisconsin, who does in a whole bunch of his neighbors and his mother. And you know, these were innocent women who had committed no crime against this man whatsoever. They were just, a, you know, happened to be his neighbors. I mean, this was a, obviously a, a crazy, sad man and who's, who became a piece of American mythology, I think. And he is the underpinning of, of Bloch's book, where he obviously is there, dare we say this, in spirit, in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre pitches and uh, arguably in Silence of the Lambs. What I think the movie does spectacularly well and perversely is bring a curious glamour to the character of Norman Bates. In the book, he's this pudgy, rather, you know, nondescript, short, balding man. And of course, in the movie, it's one of the great performances of cinema. And one of the defining, actually the defining performance of Anthony Perkins' career. And one of those performances everybody knows, even if you've never seen the movie. I mean, it's just everybody knows Norman Bates. It's not as if she were a, a maniac, a raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. We were looking for a writer, and someone suggested James Cavanaugh, who wrote some of the um, 
Alfred Hitchcock Presents, the television shows. I don't remember the meetings that they had, but when we got the treatment, we read it, and it was very dull. If you can imagine a dull script written from the Book of Psycho, it just didn't have anything. So we, then uh, it was decided, well, we need a, another writer. Who we're going to get? And then names are suggested, and um, Hitch thought a lot of Ned Brown, and uh, Ned suggested Joseph Stefano. My involvement with Psycho began through my agent, Ned Brown, who was determined that I should work with Hitchcock. And Hitchcock had seen the two things that I had done prior to that and wasn't terribly impressed with them, and also didn't care too much to work with young, new writers. So uh, Ned persisted, and uh, Mr. Hitchcock gave in. When I met Mr. Hitchcock at my first meeting, I had to convince him that I could write this movie. And I felt that the best way to do it would be to simultaneously interest him in how I saw it being done and solve the main problem of the material, which was a boy with a dead mother and we weren't supposed to know she was dead. So I conceived of the story being about Marion lovely young lady who's having a disastrous affair with a man who can't marry her. She's a rather moral girl. She wants to get married. And she says, we can't meet in hotel rooms anymore. We're not going to do this. And he kind of laughs it off almost. He doesn't really believe her. And this only heightens her frustration. When she gets back to the office, she suddenly has a large sum of money in cash in her hand and in a moment of madness decides to steal it. So she steals it and is going to go to her boyfriend and give it to him, which in itself is a preposterous notion that he would accept it. And she drives and gets lost in a rainstorm and then finds the motel and goes into the motel and talks to the young man who runs the motel and begins to realize that he's in a trap and she has just put herself in a trap and that she's got to get out of it. And she decides to return the money, and she feels good about this, and she takes a very cleansing shower, and someone comes in and murders her. And at that moment, Hitch said, we could get a star to play that part. And I knew I had a job, because he liked that whole introduction to the movie. He liked the fact that it was going to be about her. And then we were suddenly going to do this awful thing to you and say, no, 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 it's not about her, it's about him. My first meeting with Hitchcock took place at his offices at Paramount Studios. Psycho was a Paramount picture. And he was, as always, as I would soon be learning, immaculately dressed, dark suit, white shirt, beautiful tie, sat behind his desk, rarely moved away from his desk, and very warm. I found coming from him a kind of warmth that was not that common amongst directors in those days, nor is it today. But it was a wonderful, wonderful kind of rapport. And his interests were charming. He asked me things about myself. And I told him that I was in analysis and that, as a matter of fact, I had just come from a session with my analyst and he was very very curious about that but always in a very polite way but he truly wanted to know what was going on and i thought that he probably felt that there was more to writing a movie than simply talking about the movie and i was right the next day after the first meeting we began talking about this movie that we were going to make called psycho we never mentioned the book again and we never referred to the book again. And uh, there's never any talk about dialogue or motivation. The thing that was a little bit scary at that point in my life about the way Hitchcock worked was that he would not discuss motivations and characters and why people were doing it. He felt that was my job. If I asked him any kind of question like that, he would say, well, that's up to you, Joseph. And I realized early on that he had faith in the writer or he did not have faith. And if he didn't, I don't think you'd be working with him. And he uh, 
He did an interesting thing, though, uh, which uh, kind of amused me and touched me. Uh, after we had been talking daily for about a week and a half, he said that he and his wife were taking a cruise. And he said, while I'm gone, why don't you write that first scene in the hotel room? And I said, fine, I'll do that. And I wrote it, and when he came back, we resumed our meetings, and I gave him the scene. And uh, the next morning, he said to me, Alma loved it. And I was very touched, because obviously he liked it too. But it was lovely of him to tell me how his wife felt about it, because that was a little easier for him to do. He, he was not a sentimental man. Or he was, but would not show it, let's put it that way. My mother was the one who really, you know, was in on everything from the very, very beginning. She, uh, he, if when he would find a story that he was anxious to do, he would have her read it. If she didn't think it would make a picture, he didn't touch it. And then she would be the first one to read the treatment uh, and the screenplay. And she was, you know, even in on a lot of the casting, too. And it was wonderful when she died. Charles Chaplin of the Los Angeles Times said, the Hitchcock touch had four hands and two of them were Alma's. She used to come to the office quite often while we were working on it. And uh, one day was a very, very terrifying experience when we were working on Psycho. We were talking about Norman wrapping the body in the shower curtain and ways to do it without showing the dead body. And Hitch got up and came around his desk, and I was sitting there and on the sofa, and he began to act out. And he said, the camera line is here, and Norman is doing this, and he drags her out. Now he very neatly folds the curtain over her. And as he was doing this, the door opened, and Alma came in. But it was such a shock, because nobody but Alma would ever open that door and come in without a, a, a phone call or, or something, you know? And at the moment, we were so involved in this scene, and to have the door burst open and somebody come in was quite shocking. In my very first meeting with Hitchcock, he said, this is going to be a black and white movie, and it's going to cost under a million dollars. And I was flabbergasted because I had never conceived of Hitchcock at that point in his life making a movie for less than a million dollars. That's exactly what he wanted to do. He said, first of all, I cannot make this picture in color because it will be too gory. And he said, secondly, I want to make it as simply for as little money as possible, and I'm going to use the TV crew. And that's what he did. He used the crew that was working on his show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, uh, and he used them for Psycho. And he mentioned another company that was making very low-budget movies, uh, which were not terribly good, and were doing very well at the box office. And his feeling was, how would it be if somebody good did one of these low-budget movies? I think uh, Mr. Hitchcock was at the end of his contract with Paramount, and he had already moved to Universal. And I, I don't think they were pleased with, with that idea. I don't think they had a great deal of interest in a low-budget film, especially when he had gone to MGM and done North by Northwest, and now he was at Universal. And this was, I think, the last of his contractual obligation to Paramount. So Psycho was a unique motion picture in the fact that it was a Paramount release, a Shamley production, made at Universal Studios. Shamley Productions was owned outright by Mr. Hitchcock. In the book, Norman Bates is actually a middle-aged man, a reprobate, drinks, overweight, wears big thick glasses, peeps through holes. I thought he was incredibly unsympathetic. I didn't like him. So when Marion gets killed, I am then expected to switch my empathy toward this man, and I couldn't do it with the character as he was written. So I perceived a young man, vulnerable, good-looking, kind of sad, makes you feel sorry for him, and uh, Hitchcock said, what would you think of Tony Perkins? And of course, that was practically 
what I had described. Once I had written the first draft, which incidentally is the one that he shot. He told me that Anthony Perkins was available to play Norman Bates. I had told him that was sensational, and that was what was going to happen. He mentioned Janet Lee for the star part because he felt, among other things, that no one would be able to accept that we had killed her this early in the movie. The first thing that happened was that I uh, received the novel by uh, Robert Block from Mr. Hitchcock. He sent me uh, this small novel uh, with a note that said, please consider the role of Mary. Uh, it was Mary in the, in the novel. And of course, there will be changes. Uh, and so you know, Anthony Perkins is going to play uh, Norman Bates. Um, and he said, you know, the script has not been written, uh, and but so you know what the, the, the essence of the story is. Well, when I received this, I, I didn't even have to read it, but I did, uh, only because the opportunity of working with Mr. Hitchcock was enough for me. But I dutifully read it, as I was supposed to, um, and I finished it. I was very intrigued. I mean, it was so different. Uh, it was such a departure and, and such an unusual approach uh, to a movie. And uh, so, of course, I, I mean, I, I, I just said yes. I have been asked subsequently, um, well, didn't it ever bother you that... Um, the, the role of Mary, Marion, in the in the in the script, um, was ended so abruptly, and it never did. It never occurred to me uh, that that would be a problem. I mean, I, you know, it, that didn't even enter my head. Um, the whole thing that I concentrated on was one, working with Mr. Hitchcock, and two, the anticipation of what was he going to do with this. I couldn't wait to see how he would solve this and weave his magic spell and get this project to the public. As it was getting closer, um, Mr. Hitchcock uh, called and, and asked, you know, if we could have a meeting, of course, uh, for several reasons. One, um, he wanted to, you know, to sort of have a discussion about his um, modus operandi. I mean, how he worked on the set and how he used his camera. Uh, explained to me how his camera was absolute, and that as a director, he had confidence that I would bring to Marion what it needed. If I had any problems, by all means, he would be there to help me if I, you know, should need it. Uh, he said the only sort of control is that my camera has to be the focal point. In other words, when my camera moves, you have to move. And he said, if you have a problem with that, I can help you, you know, with the motivation to move at the, on that point. And I know that many of the performers who have worked with Mr. Hitchcock feel that they were perhaps hindered or cramped uh, in, in style, say, because they were asked to move at a certain definite point. I took it more as a challenge. I mean, in other words, I thought, well, that's my job, is it? So I can, I can find my own motivation, thank you very much. I mean, it was really a challenge to me as, a, as an actress to, to rethink and find my own motivation to move at the time he wanted me to move. That's how I took it. Um, and I, I must say, I think that's how he offered it. I don't think he offered it as, an, as a way to stumble or block you. I think he offered it as a challenge. You do your job, I do mine. Um, and um, and he would expect someone to be to adapt to it and, and to find their own reason to move. And if not, he was there as the director to help you. So I never understood that that um, uh, that sort of you know antithesis that happened with uh, some people. But I can understand it. But it just doesn't seem warranted to me. The other reason for uh, the meeting was he had hoped to fit me with contact lenses for the last shot when the camera is on the eye and pulls back into the wide shot, thinking that the um, contact lenses would give the look of nothing, deadness, uh, as opposed to what I could do. 
And um, we went, and unfortunately, uh, at that time, um, that long ago, the, the contact lenses weren't as sophisticated as they are today, and it would have taken six weeks for me to be able to get used to wearing the contact lenses, and so we couldn't use them. And so um, uh, he, he said, well, you're gonna, gonna have to go it alone, you know, old girl. <laughs> yes, miss? I'm Marion's sister. Sure, Lila. Is Marion here? Vera Miles uh, was groomed for uh, the part in Vertigo, and she became pregnant uh, prior to that, and I, uh, Mr. Hitchcock got rather upset <laughs> with Vera, but she came back on Psycho to play the sister. <gasps> Vera Miles had been under contract to Hitchcock, and she owed him one more picture, and this seemed like a small part, the sister. But actually it wasn't, and it was very necessary to get an actress uh, of that stature to play the part in order to continue to keep the audience with her. Because at an early point in the movie, we asked you to forget everybody you loved and like these people. And that's a very hard thing to do. You need incredibly subtle performances to get that. And I think Vera gave it. Sam, we have to go into that cabin and search it, no matter what we're afraid of finding or how much it may hurt. I know. Gavin was under contract to Universal, where the movie was going to be shot. We saw some film on him, a movie he had done at Universal, and liked him very much, and decided to go with him. Is anyone at home? No. Oh, well, there's somebody sitting up in the window. No, 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 there isn't. Oh, sure, go ahead, take a look. Martin Balsam came out of New York, and uh, Mr. Hitchcock, he always leaned to New York uh, actors on, on a great many of uh, his character roles. Uh, in, in a lot of his pictures, if you'll remember, these people um, were New York either stage, or in those days uh, there was Playhouse 90 and Climax, which was made in New York, and a lot of fine actors were based in New York. Uh, but Martin Balsam, he cast out of New York, wonderful actor. Have you got some aspirin? Yeah. I've got something. Not aspirin. My mother's doctor gave them to me the day of my wedding. Teddy was furious when he found out I'd taken tranquilizers. I'd always wanted to be an actress. I think the first time I really knew I wanted to be was when I was seven years old and I was in England in boarding school. And I played two parts there. And then I came over here with my parents when my father came over to make Rebecca. There were a lot of parts I thought I could have played in his pictures, but he would only cast me if I was exactly right for the part. At the time of Psycho, I was, I was married. I'd been married in 1952, so I wasn't living at home, you know, so I wasn't in on all the early pre-production. But he said to me, there's a part in the new picture that I would love you to do. So I did, you know, but he had picked me for that part. He was flirting with you. I guess he must have noticed my wedding ring. Hitch's feeling about the movie was that it had to be kept secret, that the fun of it, the magic of it, would exist in your not knowing the truth about the story. Up until the last moment, you had to believe that the mother was alive. Therefore, didn't want me to discuss the script with anybody, didn't want anybody talking about it. I don't think many people knew what we were doing, really. I mean, my friends knew I was working on a movie with Hitchcock, but they didn't know what it was. Had no visitors on the set. It was a very closed shop, and that was the way he wanted it. And he decided that if he spread some rumors about casting the mother in the movie, this would simply solidify it, certainly amongst the Hollywood people. And they were the ones he was most worried about. Because if they knew what the story was about, then the public would find out. So he did get word around that uh, he was looking for someone to play Anthony Perkins' mother, and the agents piled on with their suggestions, you know. So it, it, it was uh, a hoax that worked to the benefit of the picture, I think, and to the benefit of the audience who would ultimately be seeing it. Psycho was shot mainly on the back lot of Universal.
Originally, he wanted the opening shot to be a helicopter shot. Hitchcock was always ahead of his time in the type of shots he wanted to get. And at that time, he wanted a, a helicopter to come in uh, with the city of Phoenix in the far background and just uh, titles over this slow moving, move in shot, move in shot, move in shot to a hotel, I think it was on Adams Street in, in Phoenix, and go through the window and, and discover John Gavin and Janet Lee in a hotel room to open his movie. And we tried and we tried and we tried and it was just for title shots, it was just too jerky and bumpy and, and uh, moving and it was before the mounts, the camera mounts that you have today and all of that, we didn't have that and we couldn't do it. So Hitchcock came up with the idea of a white pan white pan, white pan going in like that, in through the window. The opening scene um, obviously was a key scene to set the stage for Mr. Hitchcock's manipulation. Because if you're seeing Psycho for the first time and you see the opening scene, this is going to be a story of this romance. And then when Marion leaves and meets Tony Perkins, then obviously it's going to be, you know, two guys and this girl and which one or woman and which one is she going to go with. That I mean, that's the obvious plot. So it was very important that this scene have the proper passion. Why don't you call your boss and tell him you're taking the rest of the afternoon off? Friday anyway, and hot. So John Gavin is a gentleman. John Gavin is a true gentleman, um, a wonderful man, and a, a very decent and, and sort of honorable, you know. So to do the opening scene, and I hadn't known uh, John Gavin well, I'd met him, but you know, but to start off with this kind of a scene, um, the first day of shooting was, uh, was I think, awkward. And so we did the scene, and Mr. Hitchcock was not pleased. And so he kind of took me aside, and he said, <clears throat> Janet, um, do you think, uh, I'm not quite getting the, you know, the passion that I, I think should come across for this scene. Do you think you could, you know, do something? And I said, well, I'll do my best. And so I did. <laughs> Hitchcock's only reference to his cameo in Psycho came early on in our work on the movie, where he said, <laughs> actually what he said to me was, uh, you, you may know, Joseph, that I always appear in one scene in my movies. And I said, yes, I think I noticed that. And he said, uh, I'm going to have to do it early in this one. And he was absolutely right, because once you got to that murder scene, any interruption by seeing Hitchcock on the screen would, would have been disastrous. It got to be a very, very hard thing. It started through a thing of necessity in silent movies when you needed people in it, and so everybody on the set would go in it. And then because he was so, you know, uh, different looking and rather rotund, people started recognizing him. And then it started becoming very, very difficult, because especially, and especially after the TV show, when he got to be so well known. Good evening. And then people would see and say, oh, there he is. Or they would wait and look. So he had to do it usually at the very beginning of a movie before he was creating any mood or, you know, anything like that. And it did get to be rather hard for him to do it. So he, he decided to do it outside the, the place where Marion works, which was fine because it was at a break early enough in the movie. Is Mr. Lowry back from lunch? He's lunching with a man who's buying the Harris Street property. You know the oil lease man? That's why he's late. That scene didn't really mean anything to... It, we hadn't, uh, you know, established any direct plot or anything like that. I never carry more than I can afford to lose. <laughs> Count them. I declare. I don't. That's how I get to keep it. I think he wanted to bring a bit of lightness into the beginning so that it would then contrast with the blackness that, that you were going into right after that. 
I figured that Marion's around 30, something like that. And she sees her life, you know, flitting away. So when this opportunity presents itself with the money, it was important that the audience know this woman, know that she's a good person, but know her frailties, know her weaknesses. And, you know, in a moment of weakness, she took the money and then started to pay for it. My father was petrified of policemen because apparently his father, when he was a child, knew the local police person. And uh, my father had done something wrong. I doubt anything very much. And so they said, well, we're going to take you over and you're going to have to go to the police station. Now, the story is that they put him in a jail cell. I highly doubt that. I would say he was probably put in a room, you know, and left by himself for a while, and that's it. Because he was always petrified of policemen. So that was, that part, that scene where Janet is driving with the policeman, that was the menace, you know, not to him. That, that You couldn't have anything more menacing than that. Most of my stuff uh, was done in the studio. The only actual location uh, was at the used car lot which was shot very near the studio. But it's funny, I love working in a studio because it's controlled. You know, you're, you're able to, the camera, you can control the camera, you can control the lights, you can tr control the sound. I mean, it's, that's where you make pictures, is in a studio. Uh, when you're working on location, everything has to be adapted and it's more difficult for all concerned, especially technically. Now he hated location, he loathed location. He didn't want to go in any location unless he had to. Because he said, it costs you a lot of money, it costs you twice what it's going to cost you on the set. You then have to come back and read up everything because of all the noise that goes on, you know. So he really didn't like it, really didn't like it. Hey! She is not a thief. She's a very bad thief. I mean, she is clumsy. She obviously can't disguise what she's feeling. I mean, she's so obvious because she's not practiced. So this is not her nature, but it's a grasp. It's a desperate grasp at life. The only satisfaction almost was that on the ride, she just imagined what they were saying back home. Oh, for heaven's sake, girl works for you for 10 years, you trust her. All of that dialogue that she imagines, um, Mr. Hitchcock knew exactly the timing. I mean, he knew what lines he was going to use voiceover. So he did them. He said to me the lines that I was imagining hearing. And so as he was saying it, I could imagine just what was being said, which was kind of fun thinking, oh, well, that creepy guy who had the money anyway deserves not to have it. Hot creeper. She sat there while I dumped it out. Hardly even looked at it. Planning and, and even flirting with me. That's the really only sort of pleasurable moment she had, really, until she meets someone who was more mixed up and more confused than she. Um, and she was able to realize she can't go that route either. The design of the motel and the famous Psycho House, it was supposed to be located somewhere in Central California. Uh, there was never a town specifically named. Uh, we always felt that it was up around Tulare, somewhere up in that area. The basic thing that we had to have with the house and the motel, the house had to stand above the motel. There had to be the steps down to the motel. There had to be an angle from the motel that you could see from the window up to the house. These were all designed prior and then laid out uh, after the script, of course. I remember one night we were on the back lot and it was early in the production and I had, as an assistant director, really done my homework because this was my first feature with Mr. Hitchcock. I didn't want it to be my last. And um, I thought I was really prepared. And it was the shot where Janet Lee drives up to the motel at night. And it's pouring rain and Norman comes down the stairs and everything was ready to go. The rain, we, I'd rehearsed the rain and everything. We're all set to roll the cameras and we turn on the rain. And Mr. Hitchcock said, cut. And he said, uh, Hilton, you didn't prepare this very well. And 
I was shocked. I, I, what's, what's wrong? And he pointed up there, and sure enough, what was coming up over the behind on the back lot at Universal? But a full moon. Here we are in a big rainstorm and the moon in the background. I had done everything but had looked at the charts and found out when the full moon was. So, what we did hurriedly, <laughs> and to this day, I'll never forget the wonderful grip crew we had. We had two grips with a sentry stand and a long, a long pole and, and uh, some blacks, and they followed that moon all night and blocked it out from the camera. Dirty night. Do you have a vacancy? No, oh, we have 12 vacancies. 12 cabins, 12 vacancies. Tony Perkins, well, he's just a master. He, um, it was a joy to come to work and there was always an excitement for me because it was like you knew what you wanted to bring to the scene. But the excitement was you didn't know what he was going to bring. And obviously what he brought then sparked more from you in response. And so um, it, was, it was just a wonderful experience to, to the anticipation of what was going to happen. What, what more were we going to get today uh, than, than we thought was there? He had a wonderful sense of humor, wonderful sense of humor, um, very dry, you know. He was a good friend, he was a wonderful husband, dear and loving father. I mean, he was not Norman Bates, but he was just so brilliant that the people said, yes, you are. You are too, Norman Bates. We had a lot of laughs together. We also had a lot of serious conversations. I told him early on about having seen him in Look Homeward Angel and how he impressed me in that and that I had used the image of him on stage for Norman Bates. And he was pleased with that. And he knew exactly what scene I was talking about in Look Homeward Angel. And then I told him that I felt that Norman Bates, if he were a painting, would be painted by Hopper. And he agreed. And so we had kind of that discussion writer and actor about the character. He had an incredible grasp on Norman Bates and the situation that he was in. I think Tony Perkins must have known what it was like to be trapped. I think that we're all in our private traps, clamped in them, and none of us can ever get out. We scratch and, and claw, but only at the air, only at each other. And for all of it, we never budge an inch. In some way, somehow, he knew what trapped meant, just as I did. And while we didn't talk about that aspect of it, it was clear to me early on that uh, he was becoming Norman Bates. As a matter of fact, I think he had a hard time shedding Norman Bates after Psycho. Bringing strange young girls in for supper by candlelight, I suppose, in the cheap erotic fashion of young men with cheap erotic minds. Mother, please. I felt that the mother theme was not only vital to the movie, it was vital to me because I was in analysis because of that. So I felt that everyone would have some kind of strong connection with the mother whoever that happened to be. And as a matter of fact, the line about turning mother's picture to the wall had to do with that very thing. We can even have dinner, but respectably. In my house with my mother's picture on the mantel and my sister helping me broil a big steak for three. And after the steak, did we send sister to the movies, turn mama's picture to the wall? Sam. Also with the part that Pat Hitchcock played and her line. Any calls? Teddy called me. My mother called to see if Teddy called. So this intertwining of people and their attachment to the mother was very important. I had even tried that in a line in my own first draft, not the one I, g I gave to Hitchcock. Uh, I had even tried to work it, that into the man with the money, the man with the $40,000. 
and uh, it just it, it sounded like then I was hitting one note too too heavily, so I just let it go at that. But the the whole point of it was to say mother somehow is always there, and it made her alive. Mother, my mother. Uh, what is the phrase? She isn't quite herself today. So a lot of the lines in the early scenes were designed to keep you from thinking, why aren't we seeing her? I think the wonderful thing about Mr. Hitchcock's approach to movies, and his movies obviously exemplified that, uh, is, is the bait that he, he gives us uh, and certain themes that he carries through in his movies. There was always a connection between food and death, and food and sex, and it was always put out there. You never did eat your lunch, did you? You, you eat like a bird. You know, of course. Food in Mr. Hitchcock's pictures were always very important, and uh, going back to many of his movies, you'll find that there was a correlation with food in some part of the plot. Well, the corpse was deep in rigor mortis. He had to break the fingers of the right hand to retrieve what they held. You know, it would be so nice to get back to plain bread in this house. A few years ago, Mother met this man. Uh, he interwove eating scenes or discussing it with what was going on on the screen. And the way he died... <laughs> I guess there's nothing to talk about while you're eating. There's also Tony Perkins, and it was his idea, I believe, of the Halloween candy that he was always eating throughout the movie. I really remember in the prep of Psycho, I think it was one of the most important questions for Mr. Hitchcock. Will we do white lingerie or black lingerie? And I think he is a humorous moralist. So he started out with the white bra, which was very daring in those days, you know. Mr. Hitchcock was so absolute and thorough, including wardrobe, as white to show before she stole the money, the black once she had become a thief. The censorship at that time was quite stringent, and we were concerned about showing a, you know, workable kind of bra. Usually in the 50s, you never showed uh, the workings of, of engineering. You always had a, a lovely full slip over it, probably with lots of little lace and whatnot. So this was quite daring. And then, of course, when we saw her again, it was a black bra. So he got the best of both worlds. I don't know how many people are aware of the fact that Psycho was actually the first time that a toilet was seen in a movie and actually flushed in a movie. Before that, bathrooms never showed a toilet. I guess nobody ever went to the bathroom in those movies, but it was just not allowed. I said to uh, Hitch that I would like to see the toilet in the bathroom. I said, every movie I've ever seen of a bathroom, there's no toilet in it. And I would like to see that toilet. I think the audience will be unsettled by the sight of it. An audience that had never seen a toilet on screen was going to have some kind of perhaps subconscious reaction to it. And uh, Hitch laughed because he thought I was in, in, into my Freudian kick and talking about what toilets mean and potties and stuff like that. And we, uh, we talked about it, and he said, well, Put it, put it in the script, say that we see the toilet. And I, instead of saying just in the body of, of the directions, we see the toilet, I thought, you know, that'll be struck down so fast we won't know what's happening. I had her make up the little note of uh, the money that she had spent, then tear it up and throw it in the toilet and flush it. And I said to Hitch, do you think they'll let us do that? And he said, well, it's your script. You talk to them. There wasn't too much comment about the toilet. I expected more objections on that. And uh, otherwise, we, we didn't really have any trouble with them. But I thought it was great of Hitchcock to let me go and fight the battle, because after all, he hadn't told me to put the toilet in it. 
you know. So what he was teaching me as a new young writer was that uh, you say it, you, you know, you fight for it. At that time, 1959, when we shot it, we weren't allowed to show nudity. I mean, he never asked me, and I never assumed or even thought that he would, because we couldn't show it anyway. The problem was what to wear so that it looked like I was nude. I mean, that was the biggest problem of all. Rita Riggs, the wardrobe girl, and I poured over these these um, um, strip <laughs> strip teaser uh, magazines that showed all the different costumes, but none of them worked because they all had whirly jigs on them or something. But <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But uh, we were just looking for something that was very simple. That's when Miss Janet Lee and I probably became very acquainted, because as a set girl at the time, it was my job to piece together um, and, and do a setup with the camera and see what would show. And she came up with the idea of this plain uh, moleskin, which is uh, you use for blisters. Dancers use it to put over a sore spot because um, it's adhesive on one side and then it's a soft, uh, almost flannel-like on the outside and it's nude, you know, the nude color. And you cut and you glue and uh, suddenly, you know, I was very adept with scissors and paste. <laughs> you put that over parts of your body, then, you know, everything's copacetic. The shower scene, as I wrote it, was not broken down into the shots that we would ultimately use. There was no storyboard on it when I wrote it. I just described the fact that she gets into the shower and uh, then someone comes in with a knife and, and kills her. In the book, uh, it says that uh, her head was cut off. And I wrote enough in my description of the murder scene to make sure that no one thought we were going to cut Janet Lee's head off. And I don't think that Hitchcock ever really imagined that. But Hitch had very strong ideas about that scene. So at that point, Saul Bass came in and did a storyboard on it. Over the years, this rumor sprung up that uh, uh, Saul Bass had directed the shower scene. I have heard that Saul Bass said he directed the shower scene, uh, that it was that he was the one that physically directed it. I want to put uh, that to rest right now. I was on the set every second of every foot of film that was shot on Psycho, and Mr. Bass never directed a scene in that motion picture. Mr. Hitchcock directed every scene in that picture. Mr. Bass got full credit for what he did, and he, what he did was brilliant. I mean, his storyboard, I mean, his drawings of how he thought the showers should, you know, the, the angle. What Mr. Hitchcock, uh, they conferred, and he said, show me what it's going to look like from this angle, and from this, and from that, because what I want to do is make a montage. Show me what it's going to look like so I can get in my mind the flash cuts. And he drew them very beautifully and graphically. Um, also, his, his uh, titles were, were wonderful. But to say that he directed it, I tell you that no one directed that scene except Mr. Hitchcock. The famous shower sequence of Psycho was shot on a set that was no more th than 12 by 12, 12 feet by 12 feet. I, it was a very small, confined set. The shower sequence took up one third of my shooting time, actually. I mean, I think I, I worked three weeks on the, on the movie, and uh, the shower uh, sequence took seven days, seven shooting days. So um, that was a good hunk of, <laughs> of my work. For the assistant director, uh, who was kind of in charge of the, the uh, schedule and the time and the hours, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the number of shots we had to do in there, and uh, they weren't difficult for Mr. Hitchcock to direct and to take time. Once we rolled the cameras, 
uh, it was a matter of seconds of getting the shot. It was up to Jack Russell, the cinematographer, to light each setup and, and to move the camera around from shooting straight down to straight up to cross angles to into the water. I mean, it was tedious for him and the time that it took the light. And then, of course, we had to have the warm water because we kept running out of that. We had tanks and had to heat them and keep them heated. There were many things we had to do uh, that were behind the scenes. The actual shooting was easy. The water coming out of the shower head was a special rig. Um, and it was uh, made up in the special effects department. It was shot straight at the lens and the camera was tilted at such an angle that the water never touched the lens. It was, uh, today they've got uh, ways of of wiping the water and cleaning it uh, that you don't know. Uh, but this was a special shower head. We were one of the first to ever work with a nude photo double. And that was all a secret and a hush-hush thing. And there were signs on the door and, and we never allowed a visitor or anything in. Hitchcock wanted a, a nude model because he felt that a person who was naked professionally would be easier to deal with, with an a than an actress who had no experience being naked in front of hundreds of people. And uh, he brought in a nude model, very nice young lady. It was quite charming to see the two of them standing there talking. <laughs> Hitchcock here and the naked girl there. There was a nude model, absolutely, um, because for several reasons. One, uh, he had to see what density of water and the shower curtain so that you couldn't see whether someone was nude or not. And you can't tell that unless you see someone nude to know when to cut it off. You know, when, where you don't see it, where you, you think what you see, but you don't see it. Mr. Hitchcock felt that through the shower curtain, uh, the effect of a nude, uh, if they had a stocking or, or whatever on, that it wouldn't be the same. Also, um, there was a scene where he drags the body, wraps the body in the curtain, and then takes it uh, to the car. And I, was, I did not do that. But the scene itself was so brilliantly conceived because Mr. Hitchcock brought us to this point where from then on it became what we thought we saw, not what we saw. And he did that with his camera, with the editing, so that the audience finally, just in this frenzy of chung, 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 each cut was like a stab of the knife. And eventually the audience said in their mind, this was a knife, that was a knife, and it was a cut. And it, the cut is even indicative, the word cut, because to them, each cut was a cut. <laughs> The sound that they used for the stabbing, he had the prop man bring different melons uh, and, and, you know, he would stab the melons and, and Mr. Hitchcock wasn't looking, but he knew what each one was and he said the kasabi. The blood on Psycho, that was an area where we did a lot of tests ahead of time. Jack Barron and Bob Dawn, the makeup people, uh, to get the precise uh, well, I guess uh, density of the blood. Of course, we were in black and white, so the color didn't make that big a deal, but the density was a, was a problem. He tested several things. Uh, there was movie blood, what they you know used for movie blood in black and white. Um, then there was, I think he tested ketchup, uh, and then he t tested chocolate syrup, and he felt that the chocolate syrup read the best. The swirling of the blood into the drain took some time to get because uh, they look easy on the screen, but uh, to get them the way Mr. Hitchcock wanted them took some time. I must tell you there is a shot in the shower scene that was never used. That is one of the most heartbreaking shots I've ever seen where the camera pulls all the way up and we look down on the girl lying across the tub and her bottom is bare and there was objections to using that and perhaps 
Hitch felt that it wasn't really necessary anyway. There was something very tragic about seeing this beautiful figure with the life gone from it. Probably the most difficult shot for me, and I think technically the most difficult, was the last shot where it you know, with the eye, and then when they pull back into this long shot, because uh, at that time they didn't have automatic focus. So when the camera moved, they had to keep focusing, hand focusing as they went back, which was extremely difficult. And for me, to get that glazed non look and hold it was quite difficult. And also because the water was on there, and you know how when a, 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 a drip of water, it tickles. You know, and so it was maddening. It's like having it an itch and not being able to itch it, or scratch it. There was one point when the camera was far enough away from me where they could not see if I blinked or something, you know, and he snapped his fingers so that I could, you know, <laughs> relax a little bit. We did that, I don't know how many times. Uh, Hilton and I, Hilton Green and I tried to remember the exact number of what take it was but we know it was in the 20s. Contrary to what some of the dialogue is on the Universal Tour, sometimes they say that Mr. Hitchcock turned cold water uh, on me in the shower so that I would scream, you know. Well, that's exactly the opposite. He was so considerate of the temperature of the water that I would be comfortable, to the point where it almost caused a problem, because in this scene, I'm draped down with the head in position, and it's very uncomfortable, and, and, and the eye, and, you know, it's all, it very, and the difficulties uh, technically. Anyway, finally we're getting something going. It's, it's, it seems to be going right. I didn't blow it, the, and the, you know, the focus was going right, and the steam from the, from the water um, had, st had gotten to the moleskin. Now, I could feel the moleskin pulling away from my top part. And so I could feel this. It was just kind of like going <laughs> And I thought, you know what? I don't want to do this damn thing again. I really don't want to. And there all the guys on the scaffolding, I think they had double duty up there, quite frankly. But anyway, um, so be it. Uh, but there were a lot of guys on this, uh, the electricians uh, up on the scaffolding. And you couldn't, I knew the camera couldn't see it because I was over the top. I knew the camera couldn't see it from the angle that I was. But I knew that they would get an eyeful. And I said, I don't, I'm not going to be modest, you know, let them look, because I'm not going to stop this shot. I am not going to stop this shot. And I didn't. And they did. <laughs> Tony Perkins at that time was in New York and was not present at all during that, that entire week that we shot uh, the shower scene. There was no need for him to be there, because Tony Perkins wasn't there, Mother was there. And Mr. Hitchcock had several people be Mother. He had um, his stand-in play Mother at one point. He had a woman play Mother at one point. No, I will not hide in the fruit cellar. <laughs> you think I'm fruity, huh? The voice of mother, they've auditioned quite a few people, uh, men and women, uh, for the voice. And some famous names, I, I can't remember all the names that they did, but they arrived at uh, Virginia Gregg, who ended up as the voice of mother. And interesting enough, Virginia did the, the voice of mother straight through in the sequels of, of Psycho also. The car in the swamp uh, where Norman puts Janet's body in the trunk, what Mr. Hitchcock wanted was Tony to push the car into the swamp, have it start sinking and go to a certain level and stop. He wanted the audience to gasp, Tony to sit there is it going to be exposed? How is he going to get it down? What's going to happen? Then, just at the precise moment, it starts going down and then disappears. So we had a back lot set called Falls Lake at Universal. First, we drained the lake. 
and put in a is the same type of hydraulic lift that are in uh, gas stations where you take your car and put it up and down where you change tires or lube it and we sank that into the bottom of Falls Lake with a ramp of the tires coming right up to the shore. And we had the car uh, rigged in such a way where it was pulled in on a cable and it hit the wires, went on to the ramp, and once it was on the ramp, then the ramp took over and started sinking it and at the precise moment we could stop it and then bring it down again. It was a one take shot. I mean, there was, uh, we were worried that, how do you do take two? It would take quite a while to get the car out, clean it up to do it. It was a one shot deal and, and no problem at all. Now tell me all about her. Well, um, she arrived uh, rather late one night and she. Norman stuttering that, uh, in the movie was, I before? thought, a oh, powerful oh, additive to early. the character I had written. Which morning was that? The, um, the, 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 the next morning. I think it's interesting that one of the characters in Rope also stuttered, and he was also a murderer. Very good champagne, too. What's the occasion? Well, I told you on the phone. It began as a little party for Mr. Gently, so he could look over those first editions. Then it turned out Philip and I were going up to the yeah, country tonight. you told me that, too, Brennan. Did I? Yeah. I don't know whether Hitchcock recommended to Tony that he stutter or whether this was Tony's idea, but it certainly worked because you thought he was being pressured about maybe revealing the fact that his mother was a crazy lady who killed people. And of course, what he was being pressured about was that he was the crazy lady. Oh, that, that, uh, that must be my mother. She's, she's an, an, invalid, an invalid. The murder of Martin Balsam, the day that he was to come into the house and look around and go up the staircase. It was a day's work up to the point of where mother would come out. Um, we were waiting for Mr. Hitchcock to arrive and I got a phone call that he had the flu and couldn't come in and I, I said, well, fine, we'll just close down. We're, it'll be an insurance claim and, and we'll go on tomorrow or whenever. And he said, no, no, uh, that what we were shooting that day uh, was storyboarded uh, we knew exactly what to get, and he told me to to do it. He told us to shoot from Saul Bass's sketches of the detective Martin Balsam going up the stairs, and he was going upstairs to what we now know was his doom. So we followed this out, and there was a close-up of the hand on the rail and the feet on the ground going up and moved up with him. And we were rather pleased with ourselves. We followed the sketches, and when it came back, he looked at the day, our dailies and he said, well, you've done a good job, fellas, but I can't use it. Oh, my God, why not? We well, said, you've shot a murderer going upstairs, close up of the hands on the banisters, close up of the feet. And this is a victim. This is a man who's going to get murdered. So this is, this, you have to shoot it all in a loose shot just of him going up the stairs. Mr. Hitchcock uh, wanted a special shot of following uh, Marty Balsam down the steps after uh, Mother has stabbed him at the top, and he wanted to follow him all the way down to the bottom. So what Mr. Hitchcock said to do was do the same thing he had done on uh, Saboteur, a movie that he had done early in his career with Norman Lloyd falling off the Statue of Liberty. And what we did was we made a rig where Martin Balsam sat back on and, and we were re able to turn it. And he just sat there looking straight up and he twisted and turned. Then shot a process plate down the staircase off of this other rig, put the two pieces of film together and that's, that was him coming downstairs. George Tomasini was Mr. Hitchcock's feature editor, but um, George was the only part of his feature crew that I believe came over and worked on Psycho. And George was a, just a happy, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and he had worked with Mr. H for so long, it was, he, he really knew how to put it together. And Mr. Hitchcock would shoot his movies uh, where if we were in a, over the shoulder shot or something, many times, not always, but many times he would cut in the middle of the scene. 
And the actor would turn around and say, well, what's wrong? Is something wrong? No, no, I've got it. I'm going to be over here for that. Oh, we don't need to go on any further. Let's go the other way. So George would always tease that all I had to do was take off the slates and, and glue it together. Uh, but there was, of course, more timing than that. And Mr. Hitchcock was a frame cutter. I mean, he would get down to frames where he wanted precisely where that scene to be cut. would come down and, and just check in with him daily and and uh, Mr. H would want to know how things were going and he'd say fine I have some film for you to see at noon. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock would never stay at night. He never wanted to work past six o'clock ever. Uh, sometimes we had to go till 6 30 quarter to seven but no I mean he just didn't believe in that. He believed in getting his day's work and going home. So George would run film with him at uh, lunchtime. We didn't run dailies with Mr. Hitchcock. The crew ran dailies at the end of the day. Um, so he would see them at noon and we would see them that night. Uh, if there was something wrong, we knew about it immediately uh, at right after lunch. Hitchcock told me shortly after they started shooting that the movie was going to be too long. And uh, he, uh, he said we could go two ways, remove one whole scene or chop down other scenes. So I said, I hate to lose any scene in the movie. So I made little marks around parts of scenes where I thought we could lose quarter of a page, third of a page, and that it would all add up. Uh, and unfortunately it didn't. They, they still wanted more cut. So he felt that the only scene in the movie that wasn't absolutely necessary to the story was a scene between Lila and Sam where they both realize that they've lost someone that they love. And it was a, an emotional scene and I felt very important to those characters. But it was also story-wise the only one that we could lose and uh, as, as Hitch said, I think that you feel that they know they've lost somebody they love. The scene is nice, but that's the one that can go. So that got cut. I don't think it ever got shot. When uh, Vera Miles comes down and approaches Mother, who is seated in a chair... Mrs. Bates! That scene to get was really difficult because we had to have a, a, a camera head with the wheels underneath mother and the prop man had to lie on his back and operate the wheels backwards to turn mother at the precise moment. And that took, oh, that took a lot of rehearsing in the evenings to do. We never did it during picture time, but it took, oh, time and time. And Bob Bone, who was the prop man, <laughs> It was, oh, he was glad when they finally got that shot. It was just, it was horrendous for him. You know, Mr. Hitchcock had this impish, wonderful sense of humor. He loved jokes of all kinds, practical jokes, you know, dirty jokes, you know. And I think he sort of used me as a guinea pig a couple of times because I would come back from from lunch and, and I'd go into my dressing room on the set and in the makeup chair, um, you know, I'd go to get ready, made up after lunch, touched up, and, you know, I'd turn it around and there would be this hideous monstrosity um, called Mother. And it, I, I keep, I, I joke all the time, I say, I think he chose Mother by the loudness of my scream because it was a different one all the time, and the one that elicited the most horrifying scream was the one he used. Mr. Hitchcock wanted Vera to reach up, move her arm, and hit this light bulb, which was he wanted to swing back and forth and wanted to flare into the lens of the camera. Well, I mean, you get flares in the lens all the time by accident when you don't want them, but when you want a flare, you, you can't get it. Well... <laughs> the cameraman, the first time we shot it, said he got the flare in the camera and that it was good and it was a print. Well, Mr. Hitchcock would always say, if you got it, fine. What's the next shot? He went to Daly's and there was no flare in the camera. And he came back and uh, he came to me and said, Hilton, you did not get a flare in the camera. Now, you told me that 
there was a flare in the camera and there wasn't a flare on the screen. Now let's do it again and do it right. He talked to me as if I was the cameraman with the cameraman sitting right there, which that was his mode and, and he got his point through to Jack Russell. <laughs> The day that Tony Perkins puts on mother's wardrobe and becomes mother was, uh, it was kind of special. Uh, I know we all had kind of a good time with it, with Tony dressed up in drag, so to speak. Mr. Hitchcock wanted a very mysterious either grandmother, mother. In other words, you were not quite sure of the age bracket of this individual. And he wanted a small printed kind of fabric. He wanted, the, I think, the feeling of a, an older person so that possibly, you know, in your mind you would work that this person had lived a long time. And I remember buying the old lady's shoes in Tony Perkins' style, <laughs> size, which, you know... It was precisely choreographed so John Gavin would reach over the shoulder and, and rip the dress open and at the same time the wig would come off. But it took a little while rehearsing to get that precisely the way he wanted it. The psychiatrist's speech at the end was something that, that Hitch had some qualms about. He was afraid that the audience wouldn't be interested. He called it a hat grabber. And I said, I don't think anybody's going to grab their hats and leave the theater after what we have just told them. We've just said this boy has been pretending he's his own mother. And we need a really good scientific explanation. Matricide is probably the most unbearable crime of all. Most unbearable to the son who commits it. It wasn't difficult to write because I knew most of this stuff. I was in Freudian analysis at the time and, and simply drew on the things that I was experiencing in my own life and then put them in the mouth of a psychiatrist. And as a matter of fact, originally I had wanted a female psychiatrist because mine was a female, but Hitchcock felt that it would be better if we cast an actor in the part. So he began to think and speak for her. Give her half his life, so to speak. At times, he could be both personalities, carry on conversations. I had a meeting with some people from the production code. You won't believe what upset them more than anything else. The word transvestite. Why was he dressed like that? He's a transvestite. They said, you cannot use that word. And I said, why? It's a scientific word. And they apparently had some preconceived notion that this was very dirty and that I was trying to put one over on them. And so we got a dictionary, and it's a man who likes to wear women's clothes. <laughs> and I think they were a little embarrassed. But I was shocked that they were ready to put their foot down on that. The last sequence with Norman is to show you that he has been arrested. I had somebody bring him a blanket. Thank you. Which was my way of saying they're not going to beat him up for this. They're going to treat him kindly. He's a very sick man. And to show you that he perhaps was now his mother for good. He was always bad. And in the end, he intended to tell them I killed those girls and that man, as if I could do anything except just sit and stare, like one of his stuffed birds. The dialogue and his facial reactions to the dialogue are a way of saying he will never be Norman again. I'm not even going to swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know and they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. I then didn't see anything until I saw the rough cut. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> I, when I saw the rough cut, I, I thought it was a truly a terrible movie. And, I, and I, I couldn't say this to Hitch. She was sitting beside me. And uh, he looked at me and he went, 
patted my knee and said, it's just a rough cut, Joseph. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, okay, you know, he's the master and it's in his hands. Next time I saw it, I, I, it was a totally different movie. It was all tight and paced and beautifully put together. And then I knew that it was, it was a good movie. Then I saw it with the music. And nearly, you know, fell out of my seat. The music really wowed me. I'd never heard anything like that. I met Bernard Herrmann one day toward the end of the shoot. And I said, uh, what size orchestra are you going to use? And he told me, and he said, it's going to be all strings. And I was just flabbergasted because I had never heard of anybody doing a movie score with all strings. And when I heard it, of course, I realized what, what he had done. He had just taken everybody's guts and used them for music. I worked with Bernard Herrmann on two films directed by Brian De Palma. One was called Sisters and the other was Obsession. He had very interesting ideas about how to approach the music based on the content of the material. For instance, he's described his score for Psycho as a black and white score, only strings, no percussion, no brass, no wind, because he wanted to reflect the black and white stark quality of the picture. on Star Wars, we put in tent music for the entire film. And for the most part, we used classical music and not film music. We used uh, The Rites of Spring by Stravinsky, uh, The New World Symphony by Dvorak, we used The Planets by Holst. We used a variety of, of classical pieces. But there was one uh, moment in the film we couldn't really find the right music for, and I thought of a cue from Psycho. And um, what it was was when the Millennium Falcon had landed on the Death Star, the stormtroopers come aboard and search the ship, and they can't find anybody. And as they're going out, the camera tilts down, and a hatch in the floor opens up, and Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and the rest of them pop up from under the floor. And the music that I played at that point was uh, a, a cue from Psycho, uh, a very famous three-note motif, which I happen to have queued up here. Uh, this, is, this is the three note motif. And then the music continues from that point, but that opening three note signature was very famous as the theme from Psycho. And I put it in there, and John Williams, who wrote the score to Star Wars, had been a friend and colleague of Herman's, and when he wrote the score to the film, he wrote a cue to go at that point that used those exact three notes to begin. It was an homage to Herman. Benny Herman's score for Psycho was brilliant, and in fact so much so that Hitch and I were sitting in the theatre when we were scoring the picture. And we came to the end where t um, Tony Perkins comes down, and steps into the basement and sees the skeleton mother right at the end of the picture. And that was silent. After we finished that reel, Benny came up to Hitch and said, well, you know, how do, how do you like what you think of it? And uh, he said, well, it's fine, Benny, except Surely, as Tony comes down those steps into the basement, you should repeat that wonderful theme that you had in the Shah sequence of all the fiddles going down like that. What do you think? And Benny said, wonderful idea, Hitch. He was thrilled with the idea and said, Hitch is absolutely right. And so we did that reel with the score. My script ended where he says why I wouldn't harm a fly, where the mother 
through him says I wouldn't harm a fly. And that was it. That was the end of the movie for me. Hitchcock and George Tomasini, his editor, did this marvelous thing with the skull of his mother, almost subliminal. Some people didn't even see it, really. And uh, the car being pulled out. I think that was kind of a way to, to, to give you a return to the person that you lost, who was buried in that. And also to open up the thought that maybe there's some other cars in there. We knew it was time for the film to go to the censors, the Hayes office, I think it was. So uh, it said, let's get Luigi Lorasky, who was the intermediary for the studio and the censorship, um, a very nice man, uh, to look at the film and see if there are any problems with it. So immediately after we got the first cut, we had the screening for Hitch, Luigi, George Tomasini, the editor, his assistant and me, in the theatre at Universal. So we start running it and um, Luigi laughs at Hitch's appearance in the film, which took place in the beginning of the film. And then we're, we're watching everything. Then comes the shower sequence, and we're all sort of looking on placidly. We just stop, stop, my God! So he said, "Yes, Luigi, what is it?" Luigi, I saw a breast. No, you didn't, Luigi. It's just in your dirty mind. You didn't see a breast at all. Yes, we'll run it again. So we ran it again. Oh, well, Luigi, did you see a breast? No, but we're going to be in a lot of trouble, I think, with it. We talked him out. Oh, I, I, we didn't. Um, we made him realize that he was wrong, that he hadn't seen the breast, that it was, all, that it was a perfectly charming little um, Sunday afternoon treat, the shower sequence. And we sent it off to, with Luigi to the censor. We did have a few problems with the censor. They sort of said they didn't like Janet and her slip in the beginning, and a few odd things like that, but we tidied them all up. My mother was the one who, when they saw the first print, the answer print that they were going to send out, uh, she's the one that at the end of the picture, when they were all raving, they said, oh, it's great. And she says, you, you can't send it out. And they said, well, why? What's the matter? She says, Janet Lee takes a breath when she's supposed to be dead. She's the only one that had caught it with all the people that had seen that over and over. She's the only. She had an unerring eye because she was a, uh, an editor in England in the early days. And so she got to look, used to looking at things frame by frame because you know, that's when they had it on the reels and they just turned it. It wasn't automatic, you know. And so they had to fix it up. They had a showing for the uh, cast and uh, some other people, and we saw it then, and I thought it was great. I really did. Mother! Blood! Blood! I think my reaction when I saw it uh, was like everybody else's, because you get so, you know, uh, just engrossed in the whole story. Because I never look at anything technically anyway. When I saw it, and I saw it cut together, and I saw the boom, boom, and the music and everything. I absolutely went, I, 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 I just was crazy. I mean, I, I really screamed. I, I, I never take a shower. I cannot take a shower, because it never dawned on me until that moment how vulnerable and defenseless one is. It never entered my head until I saw that. The most fascinating part, which my father loved from the very beginning, was having Janet play that part, and then she's out, you know, first quarter of the movie. One day we'd um, finished shooting, and he said, you know, people who come in late to see Psycho will wonder, well, where's Janet Lee? And they'll keep on waiting for her, and she'll be dead, and they won't know it. Well, what can be done about it? So he thought, while we were talking, and he said, you shouldn't allow people into the theatre after the film has started. 
they'll see it better to be orderly and everyone will realize it. So um, I laughed. I didn't think it would be possible to tell, tell theater managers when to show the picture and when not to. And um, he convinced Paramount, the publicity, this was the way it started. And the whole ball started rolling then. And it was successful because the theatre managers cooperated. No one, but no one, will be admitted to the theatre after the start of each performance of Psycho. It was a great gimmick, if you want to call it a gimmick, because that the people had to get in and get down before the picture started, and that brought him in, and then when they left, they left screaming and, 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 and some people and running out and during the scene, especially during the shower scene, which just added to the enthusiasm of the public wanting to see this picture. Do not expect to be admitted into the theater after the start of each performance of the picture. We say no one, and we mean no one, not even the manager's brother, the president of the United States, or the Queen of England. God bless her. In New York, some journalists thought, well, we'll catch them out, we'll show this is just a publicity stunt. So they got hold of a woman who was pregnant and coached her what to say to the manager and her, with her so-called husband. He went in and he said, look, my wife is pregnant, you can see, and uh, but she wants to see Psycho. Let us in, now the picture started. Please, sir. So the, the uh, manager said, well, I'm very happy she, for you that she's pregnant, sir, but we can't allow her in the theatre. She's perfectly welcome to sit in my office until the next programme starts, but can't come in the middle of the programme. And that was true. They carried it out. And of course, you had long lines photographed by people, people waiting to get in who weren't allowed in, which was very good. Good afternoon. Here we have a quiet little motel. The trailer for Psycho was done when we finished shooting. All the sets were saved and held on the stage, uh, and we were all called back, uh, uh, I don't know, I think it was about a week later. And uh, we spent one day, and, and it, was a, it was a fun day because the, the strain of the movie was over. The schedule was done, and it was all in the can. Uh, and we, it, it was looking back on that day. It was like a, it was like a party day with Mr. H. Of course, in a flash, there was the knife, and in no time, the victim tumbled and fell with a horrible crash. I think the back broke immediately and hit the floor. It was. It's difficult to describe the way that the. the, the twisting of the, of the, well, I, it's, uh, I won't dwell upon it. Let's Talking of coming up with the idea for the trailer, going, doing a tour of the house and all this, that was Hitch's own idea. And, uh, and also to treat it c c uh, in a very droll fashion. <gasps> oh, look, I can't tell you what went on in this place. It's too terrible. This is where she, <gasps> no, 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 no. This picture. Terribly funny has great significance because uh, let's go along to cabin number one. When Hitchcock walks in and, and pulls the shower curtain away uh, and reveals uh, Vera Miles behind there instead of Janet Lee, it was uh, it was part of the fun that went on that day. Well, the release of Psycho was not critically acclaimed. In fact, uh, the uh, <laughs> the critics didn't, uh, they poo-hooed it. They, they didn't think this was up to the standard of, of North by Northwest or To Catch a Thief or Vertigo or, or all the famous Hitchcock pictures. I think the critics didn't like being made to see it in a theater. That pissed them off. They wanted to see it in the screening room like they always did, all by themselves or with, with their secretaries. And Mr. Hitchcock said, no previews. And as a matter of fact, the critics had to see it on the day that it opened with the ordinary folk. And 
I, I'm convinced that we got a lot of bad reviews because of that. I think they were kind of irritated reviews. You could almost feel the irritation. He was disappointed when a movie didn't get good reviews, you know, because he knew how much time he'd spent on it. And uh, he'd been, I, I think he'd been a little spoiled very early on when he came here, when he had such great reviews, you know, for Rebecca and... Uh, some of the others, suspicion, you know. And I, th I think that's, uh, it, it's, it bothered him. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times said it was awful, and then later in the year picked it as one of the ten best pictures of the year. And it was curious, just the audience seemed to like it. The audience for Hitch were the most important part of the movie making. On Psycho, he'd send me out to the different theatres to check with the manager. How did the audience go for this or that? What were the reactions as the audience came out of the theatre? And I know that on Psycho, I, I said to him that the reactions were the same. It was that the audience would come out laughing in horror, like on a roller coaster. You see, and they came out, and, and in all theatres, they did that. They came up with a sense of tremendous enjoyment. This was a lovely evening they'd had watching these murders. And that's what mattered to him, to get the audience involved. While I was writing it, it never occurred to me that an audience would yell at the screen, don't go down there, or give any kind of aid or comfort to the, the victims. And it was remarkable. When I saw it the first time in a theater, my wife and I took several friends to see it because we couldn't take them to a screening, as most people do. So we took them to the theater. And I saw it completely with titles and everything at the same time that the audience was seeing it. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked. Could not believe that the audience would react like this. It felt like when I was a kid and watched serials on Saturday afternoon and we yelled at the screen. But these were grown-ups doing it. I feel very strongly that the reason that Psycho has endured is because, because of the restrictions that were put on us and because Mr. Hitchcock had to come up with a suspense story without showing what, you know, today is normal, he allowed the audience to create what they thought they saw. And when the audience becomes a part of the creative process, they're not going to forget that. And I think that's why his pictures are lasting today, because they weren't made for critics. Uh, you know, I'm sure he would love to have the critical acclaim and all that, but he makes them for the audience.